facilitator of teaching religious education and practical theology here. I'm one of the co-directors of the Center for Practical Theology. The center seeks to provide a bridge between the church and the academy, um, meaning bringing scholarly resources and insights of a university-based program to the wisdom and questions and traditions of faith communities. And we've been doing it since 2005 with the help in, the center was created with the help of the Lilly Endowment. And we're continuing that work and there's annual lecture and we can't do the part yet. So I really thank you for being here. And one of the things that we traditionally do is we do some um, recognition of folks who are here. So um, let's, uh, either, are, are there any folks from the BCI here tonight? Okay, so this is a BU crowd. That's great. <laughs> <laughs> great. I don't think we sit out on the Oh, okay. Okay, well then this is a, this is an in-house crowd. Then, then we won't need many introductions to the folks tonight. Um, you know our Dean Stone. Um, he is a, Associate Dean of Academic Affairs and E. Stanley Jones Professor of Evangelism. He's got some great books. Um, one of them is A Reader in Ecclesiology, Evangelism After the Theology and Practice of Christian Witness, and the other book I'm looking on his, his site, his faculty bio, is Sabbath in the City, uh, Sustaining <coughs> Urban Pastoral Excellence, co-authored by Dr. Will Claire Wolfman. So many of you have taken courses with the Dean, many of you have had other interactions with him, it's an honor to have him talk about his latest work, and I will have, I guess I will have him speak first, um, unless you want me to do all the introductions to the panel, that's fine. Whatever you'd like to do. Okay, we'll do all the introductions up front. How's that? So uh, we're going to have D Dean Stone speak, followed by Dr. Uh, Teddy Maynard Hickman. And Dr. Maynard Hickman is visiting professor of evangelism and church renewal and currently the co-pastor of Bethel AME Church in Bridgeport, Connecticut, where he shares a senior pastor his wife, Reverend Bernadette Hickman Maynard. His dissertation title is, uh, was, I should say, he was a graduate of the Boston University School of Theology Practical Theology Program. That title was Joyful Noise, the Ecclesiology and Evangelistic Significance of Racial Diversity and Religious Pluralism in the Experiences of Historically Black Collegiate Gospel Choirs on Three Majority White University Campuses in Greater Boston. Following Dr. Maynard Hickman is Dr. Shelley Rambo. And Dr. Rambo is Associate Professor of Theology at Boston University School of Theology, as many of you know. She is, works in the area of suffering, trauma, and violence. And her books, in, her books include Spirit and Trauma, A Theology of Remaining and Resurrecting Wounds. And the new book, it, is the new book the same title? Does, does it change? Resurrecting? It's coming out next year. Okay, so it's coming out next year, Resurrecting Wounds, Living in the Afterlife of Trauma. And uh, she has been instrumental in designing Boston University School of Theology's MDiv chaplaincy track. So we welcome all of you. We're so appreciative of having uh, Dean Stone as well as having our <laughs> respondents. And I will be keeping time. Uh, yeah. I don't know what the time is supposed to be, but I'll, I'll beat it. I'm in the Donald Trump debate mode. I'm like ready. To I'm in scorched earth mode. So. I want to also thank, in addition to the co-directors and uh, who just, and Courtney who just introduced me, thank uh, the assistant director of the Center for Practical Theology, Catherine House. Catherine, stand up and so everybody can know. And then. Emily Clyden. Emily, where are you? There she is. Emily is our administrative coordinator and has set all this up. She's responsible for the booze primarily, and Catherine for the food. No, I'm just kidding. I will divide it up that way. Uh, thanks very much. This lecture is part of a new book that I've been working on and have finished pretty much um, on a, the ethics of evangelism and looks at evangelism in a few different contexts and how pluralism is constructed in those contexts. So that's where it got started. Uh, and this particular context is one of three that I explore in depth uh, as a way of looking into the way the nation state 
constructs pluralism and therefore influences evangelism. So uh, the theme of my lecture is evangelism and pluralism. For no Christian practice is pluralism more of a challenge than the practice of evangelism. Evangelism is criticized by both Christians and non-Christians as being associated with attitudes of belligerence and superiority and as a barrier to mutual understanding and dialogue, especially across interfaith boundaries. After all, it's pretty difficult to listen to another person's religious views honestly and openly when you're attempting to convert them to your own. It would be better to say that my topic is pluralisms, for there are many different kinds of pluralisms. While there may be a plurality of religions, many, pluralism is the story we tell about plurality, the way we construct its meaning for us, evaluate it, and thereby habituate our practices, institutions, and social patterns within plurality. The fact that we use the single word religion to refer to a variety of different phenomena as diverse as Christianity, Buddhism, or even civil religion is already an implicit form of pluralism embedded in our vocabulary. We think we've identified common features that unite all these phenomena so that in fact a single word can be applied to all of them equally. In fact, this very example illustrates that pluralisms are really about unities, about how we are to comprehensively comprehend and make sense of the many. Now as an exercise in Christian practical theology, my concern with religious pluralism is not confined to the typical, rather abstract questions about the uniqueness, unsurpassability, or finality of Christ, the nature of salvation, or the status of religious truth claims, though all these questions have their place and they show up in different ways. I instead begin with the way pluralism is actually constructed in particular cultural contexts. And I then move to practical and theological critique. My larger interest is to consider the way various constructions of pluralism shape and I think constrict Christian witness so that it can only be imagined in terms of those pluralisms. In this lecture, I will focus on the modern nation state, a term that conjoins the political notion of a state with the cultural ethnic notion of a nation and in particular, the unique context of the United States with its distinctive forms of pluralism shaped deeply in relationship to civil religion that enshrines enlightenment values of freedom, rights, and the individual in a matrix of patriotism, militarism, and consumerism. I will concentrate attention on the US military as a microcosm for thinking about evangelism in the context of pluralism as it's narrated in the nation state. In some ways, the military is very unique when thinking about evangelism in the context of the nation state because of the intensity of the pluralism it embraces and because of the particular ways that violence, defense, and war making are related to its very existence. But while the military context is certainly unique, I will argue that it's also illustrative of the way pluralism is constructed more broadly and of the ways that important values enshrined in civil religion habituate evangelistic practice. The relationship of religious pluralism to the practice of evangelism in the context of the US military is hardly an arbitrary association, since evangelism and religious pluralism are so frequently narrated as threats to one another <coughs> within that context. Military chaplaincy, moreover, has become the turf on which that contest gets played out. More so than any other public space of its size and influence within US culture, the military is deliberately constructed as a religiously pluralistic environment with considerable attention given to accommodating diverse religious practices as long as that accommodation does not adversely affect military readiness. So you can do a lot of accommodation, but the military better be ready to go. The military is an extraordinary environment in this regard since far more than other pluralistic contexts such as public schools, prisons, or hospitals, it brings together persons from across the US and from a variety of backgrounds and requires that they depend on one another very closely. This it does, however, under the canopy of the big tent of America's civil religion in which individual and group religious differences are preserved, but only to the extent that they contribute to, or at least do not thwart, the larger projects of the nation state. Uh, today, at least 175 denominations and religious traditions are represented among US military personnel 
and served by chaplains representing those groups. The number of Muslims in the military has grown rapidly since Operation Desert Storm in 1990 and may now even be as large as the number of Jews. Since personnel are under no obligation to report their affiliation or preference, it's difficult to gauge precisely the religious diversity in the military. However, Department of, of Defense data and other recent studies show that the military is about 20% Catholic, 18% Baptist, that's all kinds of Baptist, and 28% other Christian. The remaining 34% includes the 25% who are reported as having no religious preference or as unknown, along with a minority of other non-Christian religions. Now, while it was not at all uncommon uh, for US chaplains in the late 18th and early 19th centuries to be non-denominational, eventually ordination credentials within a Christian denomination were required. And today, a formal denominational endorsement is necessary or some such equivalent from a religious association or fellowship of churches recognized by the Department of Defense. Christians, Jews, and Mormons have been commissioned as chaplains for some time now, but in 1994, the first Muslim was commissioned, in 2009, the first Buddhist, and in 2011, the first Hindu. Much has been made of the fact that declining numbers of Roman Catholic and mainline Protestant chaplains have produced a situation in which the number of evangelical chaplains is disproportionately large. And this representation has certainly shaped the way pluralism is constructed, contested, and defended within the military, especially in relationship to evangelism, as you might guess. In the 1950s, the National Association of Evangelicals, the NAE, endorsed the role of evangelicals in the military because it was, quote, a ripe harvest field for evangelism. Let's get our chaplains in there and evangelize folks. As Chaplain Barbara K. Scherer observes in her study of fundamentalist chaplains in the military, the NAE was also concerned that evangelicals not allow the predominance of Catholic chaplains to stand unchallenged. In the words of the NAE at that time, evangel quote, evangelicals must not fail the proportionately large number of men in the armed forces who are anxious that the New Testament gospel be preached and a real evangelistic work be carried on by our chaplains, end quote. Now, according to the Department of Defense, 33% of chaplains identify themselves as Southern Baptist, Pentecostal, or a member of the denomination that's in the NAE, while only 3% of enlisted personnel and officers so identify. The Air Force just by itself reports, moreover, that 87% of those seeking to become chaplains are enrolled at evangelical divinity schools. Founded by Jerry Falwell, Liberty University, which has its own endorsing arm, is now reported as training one out of every five Air Force chaplain candidates studying at an evangelical seminary. The disproportionately high number of evangelical chaplains, therefore, is not likely to change soon. On one hand, of course, evangelicals, including fundamentalists as a subset, typically exhibit strong support for the United States and its military. And they don't tend to communicate the kind of ambivalence, if not outright opposition to war, that one finds among some members of Protestant mainline denominations. For a number of reasons, evangelicals have less of a problem adopting the motto of the Army Chaplain Corps, Pro Deo et Patria, for God and country. The problem, however, is that evangelicals and fundamentalists also tend not to be the most comfortable with religious pluralism. And as the numbers of evangelical chaplains in the military have increased, the context that was once described by the NAE as a harvest field has now become something more like a minefield. Now that the pluralism <coughs> which characterizes the US military has been constructed and nurtured in the context of the discourse of freedoms and rights in the US should not be surprising uh, given the, the particular way that religion is positioned in relation to the state in the US. Uh, in the United States, that first clause of the First Amendment, Congress shall make no law respecting an establishment of religion, has been the grounds for probing the constitutionality of the chaplaincy. 1818, the constitutionality was challenged by primitive Baptists under the Establishment Clause. More recently, the chaplaincy was challenged in 1985 by two Harvard Law School students who argued that the chaplaincy, in effect, puts Congress in the position of establishing religion. 
The second court ruled that the free exercise clause, the second clause, of the same amendment, quote, obligates Congress upon creating an army to make religion available to soldiers who have been moved to areas of the world where religion of their own denominations is not available to them, end quote. As conservative public policy scholar Hans Seiger writes in defending the chaplaincy, quote, far from an establishment of religion, the chaplaincy is an essential bulwark of religious liberty, end quote. Not everybody would agree with that. The court went on to describe the chaplain's context as, quote, a pluralistic military community, end quote. But it is precisely that pluralism that poses significant challenges for chaplains who are required to minister to all service personnel while at the same time representing their own faith tradition. In 2010, at the order of Congress, the three branches of the military service merged their chaplain training schools into a single multi-faith education center and the chaplains there get about 20 hours on topics that directly apply to ministry in pluralistic context. Now, while the free exercise rights of military personnel are ultimately the basis for legitimating the US military chaplaincy, other justifications can be given for why you should have a chaplaincy, uh, such as the maintain, maintaining and supporting of troop morale, their ever evolving and expanding role in other aspects of military operations and advising, and their functions as, quote, a social conscience, end quote, within the military, um, quoting Kim Hansen there. Uh, though the latter, the social conscience role is necessarily muted by the very nature of the fact that all chaplains are commissioned as officers. According to Kim Hansen, and I quote him at length here, he's done a fantastic <coughs> study on pluralism in the military and interviewed a ton of chaplains. Quote, as officers, chaplains are not supposed to comment on national policy. It is axiomatic that a secure democracy must have armed forces subservient to civilian leadership, which makes it wrong for the commissioned military hierarchy to dissent. If chaplains seem to assent to unholy actions, it's not necessarily because they are dependent on the military for their livelihood or compromising to protect their careers. More likely, it's because they understand that the prophetic voice, whether grounded in civil religion or religion proper, is muted by the necessary depoliticization of the professional officer corps, end quote. It's also true, as Hansen notes, and I think this is very important, that self-selection yields a chaplain corps that is, as he says, quote, safe to have around. Clergy with pacifist leanings or who find it more difficult to serve God and country simultaneously tend not to volunteer. You're not gonna find that many pacifists uh, in, the, in the army. Uh, the long history of military chaplaincies throughout the world and across millennia demonstrates that the kind of chaplains who have ended up in military service have tended to be those who find it more natural to employ religious faith as a means of blessing and validating the military operations of the nation or empire it serves. And I commend to you another volume, uh, Doris L. Bergen's The Sword of the Lord. It's a great study of the history of chaplaincy uh, beyond the U.S. way back. Now, one of the unique and evolving features of the military chaplaincy in the U.S. context related to religious pluralism is the way chaplains are increasingly being called upon to play the role of cross-cultural and interreligious mediators and liaisons, thereby placing even a greater demand upon their capacity for tolerating religious diversity. Chaplains are frequently asked to work with diverse faith communities in foreign countries to advise their commanders um, in areas where they can be useful tactically for example, in reducing interreligious tensions that complicate military missions, and to improve and inform perceptions of persons outside the U.S. So chaplains are becoming a ve very um, important, especially as the military goes in places where they're not sure what these religions are all about. According to Under Secretary of Defense for Personal Personnel and Readiness, Dr. David Chu, quote, whereas in the past, chaplains would probably be called upon to function as practitioners in their individual faith traditions, in the future, they will increase, increasingly be called upon to be consultants and advisors to their commanders on the precepts of other world religions. That uh, means that if you're going to go into chaplaincy, you probably ought to be really taking more courses in world religions, right? Military chaplains also have an important civic role. Chaplains participate in military ceremonies outside of the church, outside of the chapel, excuse me such as installations, dedications, memorials, public holiday observances, or collective prayers on the eve of battle. 
But while these are generally not understood to be religious in a formal sense, as Zeiger puts it, quote, nowhere is civil religion both created and celebrated more than in the armed forces. Nothing is more hallowed to Americans or to war veterans than what Lincoln called those honored dead. The chaplain is a guardian not only of his particular faith, but of the common American faith in democracy, liberty, and justice, end quote. Now, the mention here of civil religion is of great importance, even though it does not frequently enter the picture in textbook discussions of religious pluralism. I dare you to take a course on world religions and find in a textbook or in course civil religion listed as one of the ones you're going to look at. But if civil religion really is a religion, it's probably the most influential and powerful of them all, because of it, at least within the U.S., because of its pervasiveness and its default privileging, especially within the U.S. military, where in the context of a manifest plurality, it provides a unity of symbols, beliefs, and rituals. As Carolyn Marvin and David Engel argue, quote, nationalism is the most powerful religion in the United States and perhaps in many other countries. It happens that nationalism also satisfies many traditional definitions of religion. But citizens of nation states have religious reasons for denying this, end quote. They go on to ask, if nationalism is religious, why do we deny it? Because what is obligatory for group members must be separated, as holy things are, from what is contestable. To concede that nationalism is a religion is to expose it to challenge, to make it just the same as sectarian religion. By explicitly denying that our national symbols and duties are sacred, we shield them from competition with sectarian symbols. In so doing, we embrace the ancient command not to speak the sacred, ineffable name of God that God is inexpressible, unsayable, unknowable, beyond language, but that God may not be refused when it calls for sacrifice." End quote. Now on one level, civil religion or the religion of nationalism is ubiquitous and dominant in U.S. culture. Yet on another level, it is utterly invisible and unrecognizable for what it is. This renders it remarkably powerful, flexible, and resilient in shaping values directing energy, and providing the broader framework for the construction of pluralism in the United States. As the religious landscape within the U.S. has changed over the last 200 years, so also has the role of the various religions in the public life of the nation. A move from toleration to, inclu to inclusion to now full participation, as William Hutchinson has shown. By, will by rallying around the nation as the unquestioned point of unity, subordinate only to some generic God who guides and blesses the nation and whom the collective we trust, civil religion provides the ritual, symbols, and moral coordinates for the way this new pluralism of participation is enacted. Politicians, celebrities often play important roles in superintending the role of civil religion as arbiter of religious pluralism in the U.S. Yet Zeiger is certainly correct that military chaplains play a critical role as guardians not only of their own particular faith traditions, but, quote, of the common American faith, end quote. The challenge, of course, for U.S. military chaplains, as for Christians more broadly, is that the line is notoriously thin between the position that serving God and serving country are compatible, compatible on one hand, and the practice of treating them as one and the, one and the same on the other. Indeed, it's the very nature of civil religion to blur that distinction. When the nation becomes an absolute value for which Christians will die and kill, and frequently kill other Christians, mind you, then we are surely justified in asking whether that line has been crossed. Mm -hmm. Now, evangelism in the U.S. military, turn to that subject. The kind of uh, pluralism that we find enacted within the U.S. military uh, is one narrated by the discourse of modern liberal rights and freedoms, coupled with a default civil religion that respects and tolerates religious diversity, but positions and domesticates that diversity for its own, in, for its own ends. It's within this complex pluralistic context that recent battles over evangelizing in the military have arisen. For if it is true that the chaplaincy exists within a pluralistic military community, to ensure that all soldiers are able to practice the free exercise of religion 
It's also true that chaplains who don't embrace that pluralism, or at least cannot tolerate it, and cooperate within it, pose a threat to the very constitutional grounds on which the chaplaincy stands. One of the ways chaplains have tried to deal with this is trying to main maintain an almost impossible distinction between evangelism and proselytism. Evangelism in this way of parsing things refers to efforts to convert those who are not affiliated with a religious body, which is permissible, while proselytism refers to efforts to convert those who are affiliated, which is not permissible. A code of ethics that you see quoted there, written by a private association of religious bodies that provides chaplains to the military, called the National Conference on Ministry to the Armed Forces, until recently contained the following statement. I will not proselytize from other religious bodies, but I retain the right to evangelize those who are not affiliated. And notice how the word right shows up again. Um, now, naturally, there's a lot of gray area in this, since some atheists and free thinkers have their own associations and do not necessarily think of themselves as unaffiliated, nor would they tend to welcome evangelism directed their way, even if they were unaffiliated. The code was never an official directive of the Defense Department, but it was regularly handed out at chaplain schools until 2005, when the Air Force was sued on the basis of a growing number of charges of religious discrimination, bias, and intolerance at the highest levels of the academy along with charges of anti-Semitism, preferential treatment for Christians and evangelicals in particular, the promotion of prayer, and high pressure among cadets to convert to evangelical Christianity by senior cadets, faculty, and staff. Though the current version of this covenant no longer retains the word proselytize, it is clear from studies on the chaplaincy and interviews with chaplains that the principle is still widely accepted. Um, the, uh, as Hansen observes, quote, the difficulty with this self-imposed prohibition against proselytization isn't so much whether there should be one, but the fact that the chaplains don't agree on what proselytization means, end quote. This produces situations in which some chaplains are seen by others as overstepping the line, but justifying themselves because they do not see themselves as proselytizing, but instead evangelizing, or to use another favorite word, witnessing. Add to this the view held by some evangelicals that certain Christian groups are not really Christian anyway, and you can see how evangelism becomes deeply problematic in the pluralistic context of the military. A sip of tea. Thanks to God. Now, the role of the military chaplain, who is both a representative of the church on one hand, yet also commissioned and paid by the state on the other, is an extraordinary and complex case case study when considering the, the ethics of evangelism. Countless chaplains are effective witnesses to Christ as they strive to advocate for the human needs of those they serve and to provide spiritual care as well as liturgical and ritual services. Many struggle to help soldiers find some moral purpose in their duties, though some find that remarkably easier to do than others. Many chaplains take great care not to try to secure conversions in situations where those under their care are especially vulnerable, and instead many speak of evangelism in terms of a ministry of presence by which they gain the rapport and trust of the enlisted. As Andrew Todd puts it, speaking in the context of the British military, quote, faith is communicated by being as much as by doing and by example rather than by seeking to convert, end quote. At the same time, there's no way of avoiding the fact that if chaplains who do their job well they advance the purposes of the military and of the nation. They become, as it's called, force multipliers. Um, and so within the long history of military chaplaincy, ch some chaplains have embraced the role of being a force multiplier with great gusto more than others. Uh, Mark Hayden, in his fascinating study of German military chaplains, notes that while some chaplains consider their priestly duty to be a primary, for example, one of the tasks was to be with con uh, convicted men who were condemned to be executed, and that was one of their roles. Many were also at the, to, at the same time to preach patriotic sermons, to build morale, and provide legitimacy to the regime, a regime which laid le claim to a divine mandate, as illustrated in the slogan, God is with us, engraved on every military belt buckle. At the same time, we know from reports of captured chaplains that even with all the heavy layers of propaganda, both religious and otherwise, justifying the Nazi cause, 
There were those who believed the war to be criminal, and who, but who still carried on the work of chaplaincy out of hope for the men that they served. Now, the present context of religious pluralism in the US military makes the evangelistic ministry of the chaplain even more complicated than in previous historical contexts. Insofar as religious pluralism is narrated by the discourse of rights in the context of the military, we find that on one hand, atheists and non-Christians sue the military because they claim to be discriminated against, forced to participate in public prayers, etc. Evangelicals, on the other hand, sue the military because they claim their First Amendment rights to evangelize and to evoke the name of Jesus in public prayer is curtailed. Because of the way pluralism is constructed in the military, therefore, the military chaplaincy has become a very litigious kind of environment. Uh, evangelical chaplains challenging the way the promotion of evangelical chaplains challenging the way the promotion of pluralism within the military restricts what they see as their quote, this, uh, quoting a person named Witt, fundamental right constitutionally protected by the First Amendment to evangelize or proselytize both in the military and among foreign populations. End quote. In other words, not only does the discourse of freedom and rights shape the kind of religious pluralism we find in the US military, it also narrates the way evangelism is practiced and carried out by chaplains who've got to live at that intersection of the non-establishment, of the establishment clause and the free exercise clause. The peaceful, corporate, embodied offer of Christ that empties itself of power and privilege is thus transformed into an individualistic and highly competitive practice in which the evangelist not only demands a right to evangelize, but calls on the state to secure that right. The dialect, this dialectic reveals quite strikingly just how habituated to state-sponsored pluralism the practice of evangelism can become. Most of the controversies that arise in relationship to religious pluralism in the military are in relation either to practices of evangelism or to the insistence by some chaplains on praying in the name of Jesus, not only in worship services, but in official ceremonies that necessarily include non-Christians. Uh, in 2006, Captain Jonathan Sterzbach, an evangelical field artillery chaplain, gave an interview to the Washington Times in which he discussed his being asked by a brigade chaplain to pray at a memorial service for a fallen soldier, but to modify his prayers to begin with, please pray according to your faith as I pray according to mine and then to end with, in thy name we pray. He was allowed, it, allowed to add, and in Jesus' name I pray. Um, it's striking the way Christians in a range of public settings now, and even in their own churches, and I hear it in community lunch and around here even in chapel, have begun to use this odd phrase, in thy name we pray, or in your name we pray, without actually ever mentioning a name. Uh, so self-contradictory benediction that purports to pray in a name, but doesn't actually use the name. Christians have clearly not figured out how to pray in public. My advice, say amen and sit down. <laughs> Sterzbach was allegedly removed from his chapel for speaking to the Washington Times about the incident. Um, and then there's other cases that could be mentioned, such as that of Navy Chaplain Lieutenant Gordon Klingenschmidt, uh, you, the guy in the bottom left here, um, who you know, has made a cottage industry out of being discharged for daring to use the name of Jesus in public prayers. So this is this very, very uh, complicated and uh, important context for thinking about pluralism. It's in the context of pluralism as it's negotiated in the US that I think it's worth asking how it is that the mere mention of the name of Jesus has come to carry so much of the freight of Christian witness, especially among evangelicals. Surely something has gone wrong when Christians offer little resistance when asked by a nation or empire to kill on its behalf, while their right to utter his name in public must be protected at all costs. And chaplains who assert their rights to evangelize or pray publicly in Jesus' name may be venerated as hero saints and put on the speaking circuit in churches and conventions. But as William Cavanaugh observes, quote, religious and lethal devotion to the unity of the nation state itself is assumed to be a normal part of one's civic duties, end quote. What we see in the US context, and especially in the military as an intense microcosm, is a pluralism constructed on the premise of freedoms and rights possessed by individuals as individuals and guaranteed by the state, which positions those individuals in direct relationship to itself. 
In important ways, this positioning eclipses the church as a mediating institution and as a transnational body from which Christians might instead draw their primary identities. And my view is that this is deadly for Christian witness. Ecclesial identity is subordinated to a higher citizenship and set of national allegiances rendered sacred and ultimate by the rituals of American civil religion. As the body of Christ ceases to provide the primary political imagination and source of unity for Christians, private markers of Christian identity become more important, while evangelism is practiced as the offer of a fundamentally private and individual salvation with little intrinsic connection to ecclesial life or identity. The church is relegated to a secondary and instrumental relationship to salvation, and evangelism is inevitably shorn of its prophetic character as it's rendered compatible with the nation's claims on us and its demands for our obedience and sacrifice. Meanwhile, the state offers its own political imagination, its own unity, its own common good, which is little more than the relatively thin coordination of individual rights and freedoms. But without a substantive common good, as Kavanaugh observes, quote, plurality is not simply a promise, but a threat, one that must be met by an even greater pull toward unity, end quote. What is the source of that unity? And as Kavanaugh goes on to exclaim, it can only be the nation state becomes an end in itself, a, a savior to save us from pluralism. Now, I hope that some of the foregoing analysis um, has, uh, however brief, has illustrates how complex a set of issues is posed for Christians by the military chaplaincy. The military chaplain situation is undoubtedly unique, and most Christians will never face the complex challenges that chaplains face in negotiating pluralism as they attempt to bear faithful witness to Christ in that particular context. Likewise, the chaplain's relationship to violence is unique and unlike what most other Christians experience as a context for their witness, providing liturgical services for troops preparing for battle, offering counsel for those who struggle with the demands of military service, memorializing the fallen, and responding in healing ways to those dealing with the trauma of war and other military operations. At the same time, chaplaincy is a posture that is not unique to the military context as instead one with which Christians and their churches have become comfortable for the better part of two millennia. In a previous book, I've argued that while, in a, in, not, this is a book, remember, uh, I have argued that while the practice of maintaining a posture of chaplaincy to nation and empire for almost two millennia certainly enabled the spread of Christianity, or something like it, that posture has undercut and distorted evangelism by subordinating the radical claims of Christ on our lives to, or rendered them incompatible with, the mission of whatever nation or empire we've happened to find ourselves. Um, this subordination includes most critically a rationalization of and willingness to use violence in the service of that nation or empire. I won't rehearse all those arguments or my own theology of evangelism here, but I want to say this much. First, these fundamental questions about the relation of a chaplaincy posture to our ultimate allegiances and to what extent our witness as Christians is compromised by the support of violence as a way of resolving conflict are decisive for all Christians, not just military chaplains. While empires enact their peace through violence, their militaries cannot be made a scapegoat, nor do I have any interest in dishonoring those who serve or who have served in the military. The modern US military is far more complex than such a scapegoating would allow, involved as it is in all sorts of civil, humanitarian, and relief work, both in the United States and abroad. But even beyond that complexity, the military in carrying out the ambitions of empire must also be viewed as something more like a consequence or symptom rather than the cause of a culture's commitment to violence. I have immense respect for military chaplains who attempt to bear faithful witness to Christ in that context. Again, it's important to remember that a posture of chaplaincy has characterized much of Christian witness for centuries, and there's no good reason for focusing the blame on either the military or the chaplaincy. At the same time, it's important to point out in particular the powerful ways that chaplaincy as it is constructed within the US military context has the potential for distorting and undercutting faithful Christian witness, especially given the ways that pluralism is configured in that context. Certainly, as revealed by studies of and interviews with chaplains, um, 
chaplaincy has a tendency to deform Christian witness by eclipsing the necessarily prophetic dimensions of that witness. You see that over and again. Um, and this is especially true where ultimate allegiances are concerned. And again, I think ultimate allegiances show up the most whenever they come down to who you're going to be asked to kill. In the second place, a posture of chaplaincy reinforces um, an already substantial tendency among Christians to privatize and spiritualize salvation so that both salvation and the practice of evangelism are rendered compatible with the claims of the nation on our obedience. Now, one way this has developed in the past century is by imagining salvation as, quote, a personal relationship with Jesus, end quote. You all ever heard of that? <laughs> a private relationship that's neutral with regard to social location, income, race, gender, politics, I mean, at least in theory, the wealthy Brazilian landowner can sing praises to the Jesus who has filled his heart with gladness right alongside the impoverished 12-year-old girl who cuts sugarcane in his fields. The same Jesus who lives within the heart of a woman from Arkansas who just paid $6 for a pair of jeans from Walmart also stands knocking on the door of the heart of a woman in Bangladesh who made those jeans at the rate of 10 pairs per hour and was just paid 14 cents for the entire hour. Sovereign nations, especially those with imperial ambition, will never have a problem with personal relationships with Jesus, abstracted from bodies both physical and social, and thus made compatible with the imperial discipline of bodies in service of the security of the empire and the goods it bestows on its subjects. As the drill sergeant in the film Full Metal Jacket says to his squad of new recruits, you can give your heart to Jesus, but your ass belongs to the Corps. Now, the pluralism of 21st century empire is very different from 4th century empire in that current versions are far less interested in securing and defending a single official religious sponsor or chaplain and more adept at domesticating all religions equally as purveyors and administrators of essentially private experiences. 21st century empire, rather than persecuting religious heretics or minorities in most cases, can afford to protect religion as a private good by assigning it to a private space that can be protected from public interference on one hand, while protecting a pluralistic public from the vagaries and particularities of religion on the other hand. Religious institutions now essentially become privatized arms of what Rui Joshua Goberg has called the great global machine. Um, now again, I hasten to emphasize that the situation of military chaplains, while unique, is also illustrative of the situation in which Christians in the U.S. now find ourselves more generally, especially in an increasingly post-Christendom context. Ironically, individualism and nationalism go well together. For if ours can be described as an age of individualism, it is ironically also an age that is deeply tribalistic and as jingoistic as it ever was where nationality is concerned. This is especially true in the United States after the attacks of 9-1-1, which had an enormous effect in shoring up the, American, the, the nation as the altar of American civil religion on which its citizens are asked to make sacrifices that are nothing less than an act of worship. This trust in the nation and a corresponding disposition toward violence requires a comprehensive formation advanced by the military to be sure, but it's already present and perpetuated in our culture through our families, schools, movies, and entertainments, and of course our religious institutions. Soldiers have to be trained to believe in violence as useful and redemptive. And while the military plays a critical role in providing that formation, our society provides the prior and comprehensive formation into patriots, loyal servants of the nation and believers in its holiness and goodness. For persons of faith, this means coming to believe that God, the military, and the nation are inextricably linked and mutually supportive. The military cannot be wholly blamed for this formation, nor are military personnel those who have somehow been uniquely or grotesquely deformed in the ways of violence. In the context of nationalism, the comprehensive formation into violence is shared by us all. That it is shared by the church, of course, has not always been the case. At several points in Christian history, the question of the Christian's relationship to the military has been posed as related to the church's evangelistic witness. One way it was posed was by Christians asking whether they could serve in the military, and for many, including, they could not. This was an urgent question for the first Christians, as many, as you, many of you know, and their identity, uh, well, it was a central and distinctive part of their very identity, contributed to their persecution at points. 
that question hardly ever even comes up for Christians today. So accustomed are we to our posture as chaplains of the empire and the confident of the goods that it can deliver to us. Uh, we're not the first Christians to believe uh, that our empire is somehow different from others, perhaps God-ordained, uh, the grand exception. And this exceptionalism then allows us to support not only defensive action, but preemptive and policing violence around the globe. But I think more interestingly, the second way of framing the question of the Christian's relationship to the military is not to ask whether Christians should serve in the military, but to ask why any decent military in the world would have us. This, in fact, is another important way the question has been posed uh, from the standpoint of the empire and the nation rather than the standpoint of the Christians. There are a lot of good reasons for asking it that way. After all, one of the distinguishing characteristics, if not the distinguishing characteristic, of those who follow the teachings and example of Jesus Christ is their resolve not to kill their enemies. Right? Mm -hmm. You can say amen if you want. <laughs> the one whom Christians follow and to whose life they want to be formed commanded us to turn the other cheek, to put away the sword, to love our enemies. Uh, he commanded us to love and forgive our enemies. Some think it's very difficult to do while you're killing them. It also, killing enemies also makes it very difficult to evangelize them, some have found out. Uh, many, if no, most Christians have believed that government is a legitimate and God-ordained feature of human existence to which we're called to be subject. But at several crucial points, especially when it comes to doing violence to others, Christians have found themselves insisting instead that they are to obey God rather than humans and that it's impossible for them, as Jesus said, to serve two masters. It's at least worth asking the question every once in a while, right? Yes, Christians are called to be where the herd is, to get our hands dirty. But to what extent are we called to get our hands bloody? But then can really Christians be trusted? What serious military in the world would have a group of persons whose hallmark is love of enemy? Some concluding thoughts. The challenges to bearing faithful Christian witness in the context of the military chaplaincy are considerable. The fidelity and contextualization of that witness requires an amazing kind of formation if it's to outbid the formation of the nation or empire for all of us and not just for chaplains. I think, for example, of a nation like Germany, where I was just traveling last week, whose, pil whose people still remember the formative power of nationalism combined with militarism and the way the church and its chaplains subordinated themselves to the imperial ambitions of the nation. Germans are shocked, for example, when they visit U.S. churches and see the U.S. flag positioned at the front of a church sanctuary. The German military no longer has state-sponsored chaplains, but rather the churches provide what might be better called counselors, all paid for and accountable to the church. That strikes me as a lesson well learned, and I could only wish that the U.S. might learn it. But civil religion in the U.S. is incredibly powerful. On rainy days, unfortunately, there's not as many of them. I think it's probably time to end chaplaincy in the US military as something like a last vestige of Christendom. And not on constitutional grounds, mind you, though that might be true, but on the grounds of the good news, which tends to be distorted when it's beholden to power, as 2,000 years of Christian history repeatedly demonstrate. On sunny days, and there's a lot more of them, I know that we need chaplains to be there as an incarnational and loving presence with the loyal soldiers who daily place their lives on the line for others. We also know from 2,000 years of Christian history that however accommodated, however domesticated the church has become, there have always been Christians who at various times and in various places practiced Christian witness in ways that were prophetic and counter-imperial and precisely within the context of empire. Evangelism is always a hopeful enterprise and one of the great things about hope is that it trains us to look for outbreaks of peace in the most unexpected places. Thank you. Good evening. Good evening. I want to thank the Center for Practical Theology for uh, inviting me to give this response, and certainly to Dean Stone for a uh, provocative and illuminating presentation. I don't have a title for my response yet. Perhaps by the end of it, I'll have one. This is, it's a recording. I'll be loud. <clears throat> On August 26, 2016, before a meaningless preseason NFL football game between the Green Bay Packers and the San Francisco 49ers, the once star quarterback and now backup quarterback and 
apparently now starting quarterback again, <laughs> Colin Kaepernick, sat down on the bench while his teammates stood. During the singing of the national anthem, in order to draw attention to recent fatal shootings of unarmed black men by police. He said, quote, I am not going to stand up to show pride in a flag for a country that oppresses black people and people of color. To me, this is bigger than football, and it would be selfish on my part to look the other way. There are bodies in the street and people getting paid leave and getting away with murder. He continued saying that he would continue the protest until he feels like the American flag represents what it's supposed to represent, end quote. What is particularly interesting about the Kaepernick protest is what his detractors assumed the flag represented. For immediately after his protest, he began receiving objections primarily focused on the fact that he was disrespecting the troops. Kaepernick responded to these, out, to these uh, assaults saying, quote, the media painted this as I'm anti-American. I'm anti-men and women of the military. That's just not the case. The attacks on his patriotism with respect to his denigration of the troops was so great that Kaepernick reached out to former NFL player and former Green Beret, Nate Boyer, where they had a beer summit of sorts. <laughs> Nate talked with him about his objection to Kaepernick's protest, saying that he did feel it was disrespectful to the troops, but that he wanted to support him in what he was trying to do. So they hatched a plan. Nate told him that he thought it would be more respectful if he knelt rather than sat. And Nate also said, and when you do so, I'll make sure that I'm standing right next to you to let people know that we're OK. At the next game, Kaepernick knelt down. And right over his left shoulder stood his friend Nate Boyer with his hand over his heart. The national anthem in this situation represented to so many our nation, yet the most salient an immediate embodiment of the nation was our military. And disrespect of the nation was therefore immediately associated with disrespect of the soldiers and their sacrifice for our freedoms. There are other institutions that are symbolic of our national identity, the presidency, the Congress, the Statue of Liberty. Yet no one said to Kaepernick, hey, stand up during the anthem or else you're disrespecting the president. Stand up or you're going to be disrespecting the Congress. No one said, hey, you better stand up or you're disrespecting all the immigrants who sailed under the outstretched arms of Lady Liberty and landed on Ellis Island and who make our country so great. No, they said, stand up and show your respect for our troops. Let's set aside for a moment the disingenuousness of the critique, <laughs> since I suspect that Although most people said they did not uh, protest his, uh, his cause, but rather his manner of protest, I suspect that they actually had a problem with his cause. Since we have yet to see a form of protest on behalf of Black Lives Matter that has been accepted by society. But setting aside that disingenuousness, I want to point out that the visceral and immediate connection between our patriotism and our military was most evident when a challenge was posed to our national identity. When pressed to consider who we really are, we reveal ourselves to be first and foremost conquerors, warriors, purveyors of violence. It is with this episode in mind that I was intrigued by Stone's use of Carolyn Marvin and David Ingalls' proposition that nationalism is the most powerful religion in the United States. And I reflect that if nationalism is the most dominant religion and the military are its most potent representatives, then its most sacred sacrament is war making. Our country derives its lifeblood from the blood of those whose bodies are ravaged by our bombs and the rocket's red glare, the bombs bursting in air gave proof. These sacred elements 
of body and blood are the proof. They show us who we are. And in this, Kaepernick seems to agree with his detractors. For while they immediately associate the nation with the troops, he associates the nation with the militarized police whose presence in black communities is too often to bully and intimidate and not to protect and serve. This, I think, is one of the representations of the problem that Stone identifies with regard to our civil religion of nationalism and its coupling with militarism and violence. And yet, I take some issue with Stone's scapegoating of this problem on the insufficiency of rights and freedom language. Stone argues that pluralism constructed on the basis of freedom and rights possessed by individuals as individuals and guaranteed by the state positions those individuals in direct relation to the state itself and says that this paradigm is deadly for Christians because the nation state then eclipses the church as a mediating institution and as a transnational body from which Christians might instead draw their primary identities. I submit that this positioning of the church as an altogether separate and alternative body from which one's identity might be derived is dubious. The church, even from its earliest days, has always had to negotiate the tension of its Catholic aspirations and the reality of its local congregational character. Though the church purported to be one thing, articulated in metaphors like the body of Christ, it was nevertheless many things, as each local ecclesial gathering negotiated the influences of its local context and history. And so we see this drama play out even in the New Testament in the development of Christianities, plural, most notably in the appropriation of the way of Jesus by Gentiles. The form of worship and way of life of the church at Antioch, for instance, was so dramatically different than that of the mother church in Judea that they had to come up with a whole new name to describe what they were doing and decided to call them Christians. They didn't exactly fit under the way they were called Christians. The letters of Paul further testify to the ways in which the call to follow Christ did not entail the adoption of a new, altogether different identity and way of life than before, but rather an improvisational, uncertain, and messy adaptation of what they knew what, uh, before and what they were now receiving in Christ, the result of which was not understood to be sufficiently Christ-like from the perspective of other Christian churches. And there is evidence that this paradigm was also evident in Judea. As we find the messy brand of hybrid identity formation tucked away in the story of Antioch in Acts chapter 15, there's this little nugget as Paul and Barnabas take people from Antioch up down to Jerusalem in order to go on trial in front of James and the other believers at the mother church. Acts chapter 15 verse 5 says, then some of the believers who belonged to the party of the Pharisees stood up and said the Gentiles must be circumcised and required to keep the law of Moses. The Pharisees who followed Jesus, who were adopted into the family of God, who were made members of Christ's body, they were followers of the way. They were members of the church in Judea, and yet they never stopped being Pharisees. The Gentiles in Antioch never stopped being Gentile. Thus, as narrated in the New Testament, conversion does not appear to us as a journey from one faith to another faith or even from one corporate mediator of identity to the church as the ultimate mediator of one's identity in Christ. Evangelism narrated thus is a call to multi-faithfulness, to use Catherine Turpin's phrase wherein one's identity is constantly negotiated between the various sources of formation that lay claim to our allegiance and shape our practice. I am at once a member of Christ's body, the one holy Catholic and apostolic church. I am a member of that one thing, 
And yet at the same time, I am an individual American, Bostonian, Afro-Latino, Panamanian American, immigrant, missionary, apostolic, holiness, Pentecostal, black, progressive, recovering, misogynist, Christian pastor of an AME church in Bridgeport, Connecticut. <laughs> Both of these things are true. In the context of modern enlightenment liberalism and its enshrinement in US civil religion, the hypermodernity that leads to a kind of obsession with subjectivity and hybridity to the extent that it destroys all communal allegiances other than the state and the market are in fact dangerous as Stone argues. But so too is the anti-modernity of his post-liberalism that tries to divorce itself from all of the modern liberal uh, co ideological commitments to notions of freedom and individual rights. The pluralism born of individual freedom and rights has been the means of much forward progress with respect to justice. This can be seen in the rights and freedom language involved in the rhetoric in the black freedom struggle, the fight for women's rights, the acknowledgement and equal protections for LGBTQ communities. All of these can be seen in these movements. But it's also seen in the theology of evangelism of James Cone, who at a conference in 1979 in dialogue with other Latin American and black theologians says this, the divorce of evangelization and politics has been seriously questioned by Christians in Africa, Asia, and Latin America. In response to the European and North American missionaries' distortion of the faith by identifying it with Western culture, Third world Christians have begun to think about the gospel in the historical context of their own struggle to liberate themselves from the relation of dependence and domination. For black Americans, this recognition shaped our religious consciousness, our perception of the connections between evangelization and politics was defined on slave ships, the auction block, and the underground railroad. In deference to Audre Lorde, who said the master's tools will never dismantle the master's house, Cone's reflections seem to suggest that sometimes the master's tools are all that's available. And history shows us that sometimes the master's tools will have to do. When we think about operating on the, lang on the plane of the language of rights and freedoms, we find that operating on that common plane of language using the terrain of nationalism can sometimes be a benefit to instigating a dialogue, as we see between Kaepernick and Nate Bayer, whose conversation about rights led to Vets for Cap, where veterans began to tweet out their support for him on the basis of the human rights and freedoms that they themselves fought for and wanted to defend his protest on that very basis. And this leads to a final point, that perhaps one of the most powerful components of Stone's uh, interpretation of the context of pluralism in the military is his acknowledgment that the kind of intensity with which the military pursues its pluralism, as it brings together people from all over the US and asks them to depend on each other very closely. It's this dialogue, it's this forcing of relationship. It's this mutual interdependence and communication on a similar playing field of rights and freedoms that I think gives us some hope towards navigating the terrain of pluralism. It strikes me as very significant. And it leads me to reject this quote from Kavanaugh that Stone uses, where Kavanaugh says pluralism will always be a crisis for the liberal state. And the solution to the crisis of pluralism is to rally around the nation state, the locus of mystical union that rescues us from the conflict of civil society. I find that there is another option. The option that pluralism that is narrated by rights and freedoms drives us to relationship, interdependence, and unity, not through common allegiance to the nation as some kind of objective arbiter of individual rights, but through a trans subjectivity of shared stories and shared experiences that leads to greater understanding, increased empathy, 
and an enlarged vision of interconnectedness of our various individual and communal identities, such as the occasion that Cohn narrates. In conclusion, Stone says that fidelity to the gospel in this context requires an amazing formation to outbid the formation of the nation or empire. My pessimistic response is that this is not possible and that it never has been. Even those Christians who refused to kill for their nation were probably accommodated to it in other ways. This accommodation has consequences with respect to participation in sinful, even demonic structures and patterns of behavior. And yet this accommodation is but a byproduct of the nature of the gospel as incarnate. So long as Christian witness points to the word made flesh, it will entail the risk of pollution. But this multi-faithfulness need not be understood as a failure. Indeed, it is what makes Christian witness possible by ensuring that the gospel the church embodies in its ecclesial practice is recognizable, comprehensive, and yes, relevant. That's a four-letter word to post liberals. <laughs> relevance is bad. <laughs> but relevance is not necessarily reflective of a desire to subordinate the radical claims of Jesus. It can instead be reflective of the genuine and inevitable tension between the claims of Jesus and the other claims that make us who we are as persons in communities. Thus, evangelism, in the end, as, Con as, as Stone concludes, must be hopeful. It must be a hopeful enterprise, looking for the gospel to break out in unexpected places. I agree with Stone on that front, because that's the only way that it ever has. Well, thank you for allowing me to respond to your work. I, can I, can you hear me back there? Okay. Um, um, I, I recalled when I was reading Brian's paper, one of the um, phrases that James Walters uses quite a bit. And he says it's really hard to engage when you have some skin in the game. And I realized when I was reading this, this paper that, that what Brian's asking me to do is also examine my commitments to military chaplaincy and, and to recall the kind of discomfort I have within those settings and how I've appreciated that discomfort. Um, so I want to, I, I scripted this and it's going to be short, I promise. At a conference last April, Jean Fidel, an expert in military and constitutional law, forecasted the end of military chaplaincy, declaring death by litigation on issues of religious liberty. Brian Stone proposes this end from a different direction, a retreat on the basis of Christian witness itself. This is what he proposes on a rainy day. On a sunny day, he can entertain the idea of chaplains continuing to do good work within the belly of the nation state. I want to suggest a more variable forecast, perhaps partly sunny or partly cloudy. <laughs> <laughs> and I want to do so on uh, practical theological terms. As a practical theologian, Brian sets out to examine how pluralism is constructed within the military and what happens under the tent of civil religion. The military chaplaincy is a site to discuss the larger issues of civil religion, and as Brian sets up, for the ways in which pluralism is constructed within the nation state. He questions whether Christian witness is possible in such places. I was also thinking of how this expands to chaplaincy in other settings as well. While he maps out current shifts and issues in the chaplaincy, such as the disproportionate number of conservative and fundamentalist chaplains, controversies over praying in the name of Jesus, it's not these shifts that primarily concern him. Instead, it is a tension at the heart of the role itself, represented in what is often called the two callers conflict, paid by the Department of Defense, but endorsed by a religious organization, the chaplain is required to pre perform her functions in relationship to two perhaps incompatible masters. From its inception, the positioning of the chaplain is a fraught one. Chaplaincy represents, in Brian's assessment, a problem extending back to the Constantinian era, 
in which Christianity wedded itself to empire. Christianity inevitably becomes an instrument in advancing the mission and ambitions of empire, and the result is that the Christian gospel is compromised. The idea that a chaplain can balance loyalties suggests, suggests an underestimation of the power of the nation state. The political imagination does not peacefully coexist with the ecclesial imagination. Instead, it always overtakes and subsumes it. The church, Brian writes, and this I think is a really pivotal quote, is inevitably shorn of its prophetic character as it is rendered compatible with the nation's claim on us and its demand for our obedience and sacrifice. In this ordering, the nation state both owns you and saves you. What concerns Brian is the question of primary loyalty and identity. Given his assessment, it strikes me that the rainy day forecast is really the only available one. Faithful Christian witness cannot take place within the military chaplaincy as long as it is constituted as such. Brian can imagine, as in the case of Germany, that religious organizations may offer services to enlisted military personnel but this work must be done from the outside on the church's terms. The sunny day forecast is delivered, I think, with an unavoidable indictment. The grip and ambitions of empire are too strong in his portrayal to convince me that incarnational presence is possible. It's a more variable forecast, forecast that interests me and one that picks up on Brian's intimations of prophetic and counter-imperial possibilities. But even that feels like a concession in the framework that Brian presents. At various times and in various places, Christian witness is practiced. Practiced. Perhaps a break of sun. But there's, that seems too incidental, almost serendipitous. At various times and various places that happens, every once in a while, while it may spring up or happen. But isn't this precisely where a practical theologian might begin to probe? the various times and various places in which practices might provide a, a prophetic or counter-imperial uh, witness. In my engagements with the military, I'm, I have always been dissatisfied with how theology names the territory that I'm in. Few theological options are set out for me. Either I'm a Christian pacifist or a re Christian realist. E either I'm with Niebuhr or against him. It's a very modern framing, a modern theological framing that flows from the context of the modern nation state between the world wars. Brian reiterates the issue in this recognizable framing as one of Christian participation in war. But it strangely feels as if Brian has stepped away from practical theology's more texturing modes. Perhaps this is the territory that practical theology students bump into, if any of practical theology students are here. Perhaps it's the territory that practical theology students bump into in their projects, the kind of normative vision of one's own theological uh, work or one's own theological positioning, which I think we see in Brian's um, practical theological um, engagements with, with chaplaincy. As much as I'm wary of the modern nation state and its totalizing force, I am as a feminist theologian also wary of appeals to Christian witness as a pure regulative category. Christian witness seems the unprobed term, the given in Brian's paper. Faithful Christian witness, what is its texture? What does it feel like? What does it smell like? What does it, does it taste like? Can there be manifold witnesses to another way within the belly of the imperial beast? I suppose my leading concern is with how you position, your, position yourself within empire, not whether you do. And the ministry of presence that Hansen and Todd name is too quickly translated into mission effectiveness. This presence is flattened on both sides, either as a fortressing of imperial aims or as compromised witness. But the practices of chaplains can't be reduced to that. And it is Jörg Rieger's Christological surplus that I'm after, because I'm not convinced that an inside or outside is so clearly definable. According to, your, uh, to Rieger, this surplus speaks to what is unassimilable within empire. I often thought about the unassimilable in terms of movements and affects that cannot be reduced either to the logic of empire 
or certain for forms of theologic. Practical theologians can give texture to witness in a way that perhaps other theologians cannot. They can catch these various times and various places and insist that these variables matter. The challenge for me is to offer a vision of a ministry of presence that stays close to the surface of skin and that focuses on prophetic and counter-imperial practices within these systems. It's a presence that insists that while the nation state excarnates the spirit of the soldier to sustain the spirit of the nation, the chaplain insists on what Jonathan Ebel describes in G.I. Messiahs as the complex humanity beneath and behind the uniform. It's my belief that Christianity can narrate this complex humanity and that chaplains can move within the military in more supple waves, ways that lead me to a variable forecast, partly sunny, partly cloudy. And I think um, as well, and I, I wish Brian had the opportunity to share more of his interviews because I think the, what's interesting is the voices of chaplains are surprisingly absent from the paper and that's, you know, he was focused on the a description of the problem. But it's precisely, I think, the experiences of chaplains, many of the, whom are STH alums, that have really textured my picture of the military um, because it's, it's, it's not a certain vision of Christian witness in a post-liberal vein that keeps me from entering the military. It's also feminist theology. Feminist theologians do not understand why I would ever cross the line into military settings. So it's interesting, I think, too, that there are different theological lines set up and that once I cross them, I'm suddenly compromised, right? So, on, a, on feminist theological terms, but may, maybe also on kind of post-liberal terms. So this has been interesting territory for me and one that I think practical theology gives me a way of thinking about um, the ways in which chaplains have, um, have complexified my own picture of how I think about the military, but have also um, kind of convicted me of the idea that I can have clean hands, that I can kind of have, like there's no pure place to stand. And I think, uh, Teddy was trying to get at some of that is the idea of like either inside or outside um, that I, I think maybe my belief in the military industrial complex is that it, it's in all of us and that it's not whether or not we engage it, it's, it's how. And I think chaplains have given me a more complicated picture of what Christian witness looks like in, in settings that I think are are really much more complex than I'd ever um, anticipated. I think about, um, there's a chaplain that I spoke with down at, in Fort Jackson at the military um, chaplaincy college, and, and he said to me, this could actually could be could feed in really well with, with Brian's uh, analysis, is that he said, I'll never forget the one time when a soldier came to me for counseling, and he was really fraught by, um, he, he was really torn up about what he had done in, in the last, um, you know, when he, had, he was, in, um, was in battle. And I realized as a chaplain when he came to me in that counseling session that my responsibility was to get him fit to go out and do it again, mm. right? So there's, there's a, there are these moments that military chaplains, they're very cognizant, co cognizant of like what they're being asked to do. And yet I'm curious that I, about reducing the chaplaincy role to, to that like there in the belly of like this mi the mission altogether because I've, I've found it much more uh, textured I guess is the way that I want to say it. I think of Maya Dietz who I just talked to, many of you know, Christian Science Chaplain. Um, she was recently stationed in Japan um, and she she's finding out a lot about sexism within the, mil <laughs> the military um, chaplaincy. And she told me that she was the only chaplain out of 40 chaplains who would even consider counseling same-sex couples. Um, so she found herself at every marriage encounter weekend, like within the military, like every weekend, since she was the only chaplain to do this work, mm -hmm. she was just every weekend going to marriage encounter um, conventions and, or, or retreats. And, um, and she did so because she had a strong theological vision of personhood rooted in the vision of the Imago Dei um, and, and the sense of the kind of full humanity of all persons before God. Um, 
So I guess in response, I want to say perhaps I have crossed a theological line, the line that renders my own, my own witness compromised. That's often how I feel when I was reading the paper. I thought by my, by my engagement with kind of theological education for military chaplains, by my, you know, am I just inevitably compromised in the picture that, that Brian uh, sets out? And perhaps in the end, I am Niburian. But my feminist and womanist theology students might ask, why does he get to draw the line? Thanks. <laughs>